are not familiar with yours, I'm going to just read the short bio uh, that was in the uh, uh, announcement for the event. Jos Reckfeld explores the sensory consequences of systems of his own design, often inspired by forgotten corners in the history of science and technology. His films and installations and performances are an attempt to reach an intimate and embodied understanding of our technological world. His abstract films have been shown worldwide in a wide range of festivals and venues for ex experimental film, animation, or other kinds of moving image. He had retrospectives at the Barbican in London and the Ann Arbor Film Festival, among others. And in 2017, he was filmmaker in focus at the International Film Festival of Russia. He has realized several installations and was involved in many collaborative projects involving composers, music ensembles, theater companies, dance companies, and artists' labs. Next to his artistic work, he has been giving lectures since 1993. This is why he has He's no, not nervous today. <laughs> um, he has been teaching since 1996, and from 2008 to 2014, he was the course director of the Art Science Center faculty at the Royal Conservatoire and Royal Academy of Arts in The Hague. Since February 2017, Jos has been affiliated to the School of Arts, University College Ghent, CASP, uh, as a, an artistic researcher, and he is a member of the SPAM Studies in Performing Arts and Media Interdisciplinary Research Center at Kent University. I won't read the abstract of today's lecture. I will leave this entirely <laughs> to you. <laughs> okay, yes. thanks. Uh, well, I'm super happy to be here as well. Uh, there's all kinds of strange connections, and I think one of the interesting things about, I mean, when people read the bio before you start talking, you can only disappoint. <laughs> It's always a bit difficult, but I think one of the interesting things about my current situation in Ghent is that I'm actually a student, so I'm also approaching this as a kind of student presentation, so I'm mostly talking about things I'm you know, researching and learning and I don't know. Um, I have sort of 11 short chapters I want to talk about, um, and uh, so there's some introductory ones, then there's a few which are really about ongoing research and also my sort of attempts to make sense of things, which is not going very fast. And then at the end I will start, I will talk about some artistic projects I'm um, starting on mostly also. Um, so first some introductory things about, uh, you know, who I am, what I do, these kind of things, and where I come from. Um, well, I started to be interested in making abstract films through encountering like films I really liked, like uh, films by Oscar Fischinger, for instance, James Whitney, like abstract animation filmmakers. Uh, and all these people were part of a tradition which is called visual music, and which is basically the idea that you can um, do achieve some kind of visual art which has the same effects on people as music. So it has the same ideas of... Uh, emotional impact, but it also has the same idea of composition, more formal ideas of composition. Um, I'm not going to talk about this very long, it's just uh, to sort of situate myself, but it is a tradition, so you have people uh, sort of started with thinking about analogies between musical tones and colors, which is something which is thoroughly discredited, uh, but there are people, there's a long history of interesting pioneers who actually build instruments. This is Alexander Wallace Brimington, one of these Examples I like because he was a painter. He came from a quite a rich uh, aristocratic English background And he basically spent his whole family fortune on base building a couple of these beautiful wooden paneled instruments And what they have they have 12 arch lights in them arc lights So arc lights is like you know welding you have two electrodes and go mm -hmm. with a lot of voltage and you have a beautiful light Well, there's 12 of them in there each of them has a different color filter and if you touch a key one light lit up and you see the color corresponding to the tone. So he would play. All these instruments burn down, so the only thing we still have is pictures and his writings. Uh, then, I mean, there's lots of these pioneers, I'm not going to talk about them very long. This is also a really interesting person, this is Mary Heller Greenwald, uh, who was active in the 20s, 1920s, 1930s. Um, she was quite a brilliant inventor. So what you see here is something which looks like a record player. And in fact, what it is, it's a disc, but on the disc is encoded uh, a signal, 
and the signal is controlling colored lights. <coughs> so she would play discs, but the discs would not play sound, but they would actually play uh, light composition, which would then be visible in the transparent white uh, beautiful sculpture. Um, so she invented lots of things. She also invented, for instance, the interface is a, a light color instrument she invented. She, she has a lot of patents also on things which are still quite common in theater lighting. Uh, and this is basically a kind of light control interface with lots of different types of interfaces. Uh, she also has ideas about notation together with it. She actually built these things, so I think 20 of these were built. Uh, uh, and then this is the notation, so you see a musical piece by Beethoven, piano piece, and then in between the, the musical bars you see these symbols. These are like you know, crescendo, decrescendo you know, for music. So this is about light intensity and all these things are codes for different uh, colors or different types of lighting also. Um, so there's more of this idea of notation and then this is her playing. And what I found interesting about this tradition, and it's also, you know, I studied electronic music before, I got really interested in abstract film because of this tradition. And what I found in the end, the most interesting about this is that uh, com building these instruments is also part of the com of composing. It's like if you have traditional music or you know, classical music, the orchestra is a given, so you can just limit yourself to writing notes and write the good notes and then you give them to these orchestra people and they play. Uh, for this, uh, also for electronic music, but also for these ideas of visual music, what's the case is that you uh, also have to design these instruments. So by designing these instruments, you design also your artistic language uh, and what I got really interested in is this sort of ideas of sort of mutual construction between artists and their tools. So that if you change your instrument, you will compose in a different way, uh, etc. Um, well, this is a picture of Andrew Pickering. I will show it a few times just to remind myself that I have to talk something to do with Andrew Pickering. And the link here is that he wrote this fantastic book called The Mangle of Practice. I don't know if people know this book. Um, uh, Andrew Pickering was originally a particle physicist and he became a sociologist and theoretician of science, uh, philosopher of science in a way. And he has this, uh, he wrote this great book called The Mangle of Practice and he gives an account of how uh, scientists work, which I really recognized as something which uh, describes how a lot of artists I know actually work. And he talks about something he calls the mangle, and the mangle, I think in Dutch is the, the vringer. Uh, so you have this thing to dry your laundry, you have this kind of press, and you, you, know, you turn the, you put the laundry in, you go like this, and then the laundry sort of gets out uh, stiff and then dry. Um, and he compares uh, the practice of science to the mangle. And the thing is that you know what goes in, and that scientists go in, and scientific concepts go in, uh, scientific procedures, instruments go in, theories, uh, and then practice is in fact that you turn the handle and then what gets out is actually the same elements except that there will be some transformations. And the whole idea of practice is that you know, don't know beforehand what transformation will happen. If that perhaps after an experiment the theories are adjusted or perhaps the devices will be adjusted, changed, or the scientist will have changed, you don't know what will happen. So that's, um, and for me, that's a very interesting description of what happens in the <coughs> artist studio. That you have all these elements and you have practice and then stuff happens. And you don't know before if the concepts change or the tools change, all these things are interdependent. Um, so for me, yeah, this idea of visual music is really connected to ideas of composing and then also that some of this composition is realized or articulated in making the tools. I hope that makes sense. You can always interrupt me. Uh, then, so there was one sort of part of this, where I come from, and another part is that at some point, you know, I built my own machines to make uh, animated films. Uh, so this is a still from one of my films. I realize I'm not actually showing much of my work, so you will have to find other ways to see it. I'm sorry, I'm talking about my research. Um, so this is one still of my film, so enjoy it. Yeah. I know. Um, so this is my studio, how I made it, and I at that time this is uh, sort of end of the 90s. I was really interested in uh, pre-cinema, going back to what the sort of essence of cinema is. And for me, that essence of cinema was 
chopping times into little bits. Um, so you get to, you know, this pre-cinema people, like this is Etienne Jean Marais on the right, and he is wiggling this very long stick in front of a chrono photograph machine, so which is basically uh, a camera where you have long exposures and then you have something which interrupts these exposures. So you have something that resembles a stroboscope on, on this negative, and then you can analyze the movement. And this is a very long, uh, I mean, he has a fantastic uh, uh, body of work he did. Um, and basically I was using the same techniques to, you know, I had a, I built, this is my studio at the time, so you have a film camera here, there's a light, which is also interrupted by a disc with holes, so it's shining on there. So you basically have a kind of stroboscope shining on this thing in the back, and the thing in the back is basically just a line, and it can rotate, and it can move up and down, left and right, uh, so I can animate this line, and I can make stroboscopic recordings of it, you could say. Uh, and then these recordings I would then combine and with color filters in, in different layers and then you get images like this. Um, so for me, this started as a way to produce images, which has a relation to really what to me was a sort of essence of cinema. And then I realized when I was starting to investigate uh, the heritage of Etienne Joumaré that in fact all these things also have meanings because all these sort of technological objects or these technological principles they're part of culture, they're part of the technology around us, so they're embedded in what we do. Uh, and one very interesting uh, thing, which also came out of the research of Marais, like Marais is in a way somebody who caused the invention of cinema, but he also has a heritage in uh, uh, something which is called scientific management, and it's the idea that you can uh, study with these tools the, the motions of workers to make the work more efficient. So this is a stereoscopic slide of the motions of the finger of a typesetter. So you have uh, little lights, flickering lights on the fingers of somebody who's doing typesetting. This is, you know, 1910 or something. And then you have uh, a stereoscopic slide, so you can see the spatial pattern of this motion. And you can also see the speed because of the, f you know, the flickering, flickering frequency of this light is known. So you can sort of calculate how many you know, fractions of a second will this movement will have taken. Uh, so there were lots of these kind of research. This is another one. This is a study of people doing, I'm um, always sort of standing there when you're doing this, when I show this slide. It's like people working on the assembly line. This, I think it's a soap factory, so they're stamping soap. And there's this guy is working, I assume it's a guy, I think it's short, um, who is working on this machine. And he's just doing the same motion all the time. Uh, and then uh, this uh, people, these are, this, these are this is research by Frank and Lillian Gilbreth, who also worked for the Ford uh, factory. Um, and what these people would come in, they would make these kind of pictures, and then they would analyze the motions of the workers. And then the, uh, the, what they discovered is that the most beautiful curves are also the most efficient motions because there's no hesitation. So the, you know, it's these polished curves. If you do this for ten years the same motion, eight hours a day, you get really good at it. Uh, so you get these curves, so you, you sort of pick one of the ideal curve, you make a 3D wire model, and then they would, uh, they would work with choreographers who would then train new workers, teach them these exact uh, movements, because they already, you know, just to eliminate this whole phase of getting rid of all the sort of hesitation, if you just really, uh, yeah, learn how to do this efficiently. Um, so you have, I mean, I'm already talking too long about this, but uh, which is bound to happen, so I don't know how much time we have. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so you have this whole, this is also, I'm not going to go into, but this is basically, it looks like a film script, and it's, it's uh, an analysis of the assembly process of a Parker pen. You know, these beautiful Parker pens. Uh, so this is how they are assembled. And then you have all this, um, you have a script for the left hand, right hand, and then there's these things like unavoidable delay. So it's the right hand mm -hmm. of all these workers who are being paid by the director of the Parker Pen Company, <laughs> and their right hand is not working mm -hmm. because it has to wait for the left hand, and this, this hurts. <laughs> and then, you know, you try to figure out, can't we do swap things around and make this more efficient? Um, so this is, you know, this is a famous uh, film by Charlie Chaplin where you have this scene of, the, um, of modern times, where you have this scene of the assembly line being sped up by the factory director. Uh, 
there's exactly, I mean, it's not, it's hardly a caricature. It's pretty much, uh, you know, what happens. This is, and what's, what's interesting for me is that if you look at this technology of cinema and if you make a film which is in a way purely abstract talking about this technology, you're also talking about this. Like for me, this, I'm still figuring out how this works, but for me, this is the meaning of these technological principles. Like, like they're, they're embedded, they have meaning because they're also embedded in society. I hope it makes any sense. It will perhaps be more clear. Well, for me, you know, I have this film. This is a, I will show my slide here, my one still. Uh, this is a film of 20 minutes, which is a completely abstract composition. Uh, so it's in a way music, like it's, you could say it's absolute music. Um, even though it's sort of didactic, like it really starts by more or less showing what's happening, you know, you're chopping the motion into bits, you know, there's a didactic element to it. But for me, I mean, there's multiple levels at which you can read it. I'm totally fine with people who watch my films and just space out and, and experience it as a psychedelic trip. That's certainly also possible and great. Uh, but, on the, uh, but for me, I realize that for me, a level of, uh, of content, let's, or let's yeah, conceptual um, subject of this film is this technology and this technology is not only abstract it's also it has relation to all these things where uh, things like the assembly line uh, the you know scientific management the idea of how time is chopped into little bits in other parts of society so for me that's also a film which is about that and how that works i mean it's also still something i'm figuring out um, but yeah does that make any you mean you, so you mean you put yourself in an assembly line? Uh, no, not really, no. I'm saying that for me, making a film about this is not only making a film, an abstract piece of visual music, it's also, also uh, making a film which deals with this phenomenon of, of chopping time into bits and also what it means. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, we can perhaps talk about it. I mean, we will come back mostly what I do now. Um, okay. So I talked about visual music, I talked about and, and about how making tools is part of sort of defining a language. I talked about how for me these technical principles I'm using in my work have a, a meaning. Um, and then there's a few other things, like one thing I realized, this is from when I started studying, I also studied in The Hague. Uh, but before you came and before I was a director there. Um, and when I came there, I was, uh, I don't know, 20 years old. And I actually came to study stonology, and then, uh, which is an electronic music uh, course there. And then they had this uh, project, this conservatory in The Hague, where they had this project every uh, two years, I think, where they invited a living famous composer to be there for a month. And then uh, this guy was there for a month, John Cage, and I had never not really heard of him. Uh, and I realized later that what I experienced during these two months he was there had an enormous impact on me. And, and there's basically two impacts. There's one is that he showed to me very concretely what composition was, because he explained how he made his pieces, and then I realized that composition is, is also just very practical. Like, if you study composition, there is a bit of a cult, like the comp composers are the sort of you know, the, the Platonists of art, like they, you know, they are in touch with it's this sort of mathematical essence or something. Um, but with Cage, it was very different. It's a bit like, you know, if you build a table, you want to make sure that the, the legs are straight so it doesn't fall over. And, you know, he has the same role. He has you know, a bunch of musicians and it's a bunch of time to fill. How do we do this? Um, so that I liked very much. It's very practical. And there's this thing is that, uh, of course, he's known for his chance operation, that he was very precise in leaving some things open to improvisation or to chance and being extremely rigorous in other aspects of uh, completely determining it. So I, I found this balance always very interesting and it's something which comes back in my in basically all my work. This is also there's always moments which are completely open to improvisation or to systems which are complex in some way or which I cannot predict, uh, whereas other aspects are very meticulously planned. So I was, I'm really interested in uh, complex systems. For a long time I've been writing software to generate images. And then the inspirations of this for this software always came from things like artificial life or uh, yeah, 
<laughs> systems with lots of agents. Uh, so this is one of my sort of cybernetic heroes, Walter Ross Ashby. And this is the project for Brady Hat. But I don't know if some of you, I guess, are familiar with this. Uh, so basically there's four machines and each of them roughly you could say is like a neuron and what these machines do, they're like clunky electromechanical machines, is that basically they adapt to each other. So they, they sort of sense the voltages uh, which the other machines have for cables. And then basically if you hit one of them, so the voltage changes, then the other three start to adapt. Like, okay, oh, what just happened? And it changes the connections and this will sort of go on until there's a new equilibrium. Um, so I find this extremely interesting. For Walter Ross, actually, this was a very small example of what happens in the brain, how we sort of keep equilibrium. And for me, I was thinking, for instance, if you look at this image, it's a bit, basically what happens is not very different from the four uh, neurons, except that every pixel is, for instance, a neuron, and it's connected to neighboring pixels. And then you also get this kind of processes of adaptation and things which, which happen. Um, uh, and what I find, yeah, well, I'm not going to talk about this. Uh, so this is another example of my work. Um, and what I find interesting is that, and that's why I showed after Cage, is that it's, uh, there's also here this level of control, not control. Like, uh, basically, with this kind of software, you create, like, a small, li very limited universe where things can happen, and what then happens is not completely under control. Like, this always surprises, and that's, I find, really interesting. So that's basically why I'm interested in making these things. Um, I'm, I think I'm, if I talk like this, it's not gonna, I'm not gonna get to the end. We have a full hour, so we have half an hour. Maybe. Exactly. Oh. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, okay. Um, Yeah, I think I do have to, like, this is where my research project started. In a way, I was, for uh, a one month, I was a, a resident in, um, in Amsterdam on the science campus. There's an institute called AMOF. It's uh, where they do uh, everything which is on a molecular scale, so nanotechnology, but also biophysics. Uh, super interesting uh, research place. Uh, I had, I thought it was super interesting there, like to have, a, there's a fantastic uh, repertoire of all kinds of mechanisms on this small scale, which are very different than the kind of mechanisms we know on our human scale. I thought it was super interesting. And what I find also fascinating, but both in a sort of scary as sort of obsessive way, is the sort of level of detail they have. Like they can actually really manipulate matter on a molecular scale. Uh, I mean, I, yeah, I remember one thing where you could basically see uh, labeled protein molecules in the cell and then the, you could sort of see well there's 40 of them and they're going there that way which I thought was completely mind-blowing that this is possible these kind of things um, and then I also realized that as an artist engaging with this um, I felt really like oh here I really have to sort of relax and think about this like what is going on uh, because I don't want to make because I, I was thinking I really want to engage with this on the, also on a more critical level and not just make pretty images which they can then put in their yearly research reports, which is you know, what could also happen. Um, so I was thinking, okay, I really, I'm really interested in working not with simulations but with physical systems like they do. But then if you do that, I was really thinking, well, I have to know much more about what I'm doing. So this is where this research started. So this is, you know, I'm doing a PhD. Uh, so I'm sort of in the middle. Uh, so we are sort of past <laughs> the glorious <laughs> part. Uh, so I'm here, uh, and we're you know I'm sort of making sense of what's going on. It's basically uh, so if you take this as a structure of my talk, <laughs> we're sort of here now. You got the beautiful camera. Yeah. Um, so uh, I first want to you know talk about what my research is doing. Uh, and then I, I, I basically I'm in the stage of, of collecting like another way to think of how my research is going is that I'm, I'm you know I have, I have six years for this I'm now th uh, three years in uh, the first two years I was getting lost and that was also good you know I'm expanding and then now I'm sort of in the middle of focusing like things are sort of falling in places I collected a lot of things and I'm discarding and I'm you know, finding my focus and then at the end hopefully 
I still have two years to actually make sense and draw consequences of things. Um, so uh, I'm going to, going to try to be a lot faster, which is pretty hopeless. Um, so I hope from what I said, it becomes a bit clear, like what I mean with if if I talk about if I use this word dialogues with machines. It's not you know I'm not talking to Shiri or Alexa or something. What I'm interested in is this process of mutual construction of media artists and their tools and artistic languages. Um, and uh, I st I've come to take this really literally. Like if you have a dialogue, you basically have a kind of distance, and then there's a partner here and a partner there, and then I'm talking to these machines, or I have a dialogue with these machines. So the question becomes, how can you actually think in a, in a s way that makes sense the agency of this machine? Like, is that machine autonomous, or is technology autonomous? And there's different ways you can think about this. You have Pickering again, uh, who has this idea of material agency, like part of his thinking about science is also thinking about material agency, and he has this uh, thing he calls the dance of agency, and then he's mostly talking about uh, exact sciences, where you have a kind of laboratory situation, and then what's set up is a kind of situation where matter somehow performs, and then this performance is captured, and then the brain starts thinking, and the mangle sort of starts turning, and then new experiments are performed. So that's one way to think about it. There's, uh, this is Jane Bennett, who has this uh, book called Vibrant Matter. It's also about thinking about how matter actually also is acting on us. Uh, there's Bruno Latour, who has this uh, the actor network theory. So the idea that you have, if you think about science and also about how science is working in society, is that it's not only the humans who are doing things, there's also forces and uh, machines which are doing things. Uh, this is uh, Hans-Jörg Reinberger, who has this idea of experimental systems, also a sociologist of science, who is sort of studying the dynamics of, for instance, scientific institutions. Like if you found a lab of 10 million euros and you find out that your research question is doesn't make any sense, you will not close your lab you will just sit around and you know, continue doing investigations until you find something which is interesting, which is a way that he has very interesting examples of you know, situations like this. So for instance, he's talking about those kind of things. And this is Karen Barat who has this idea of uh, agential realism is that uh, even like scientific phenomena are actually being sort of co-created, you could say, by the world and by the observers. I'm summarizing also part of these books I haven't actually really read, so don't ask too difficult questions. <laughs> um, but um, so um, so that that is a whole sort of you know way how this this idea of some kind of agency of material is present in a lot of thinkers now. Um, but also there's other ways to think about it. This is a much older book, is by Langdon Winner, who's a, also a historian of technology. And he gives a very interesting uh, interpretation of Frankenstein, which is, of course, a bit of the, yeah, it's a bit of the cliche, and especially if you think of the, about the film. Um, but then he talks about not so much the film, but uh, very much about the original book by Mary Shelley. And what's interesting about the original book is that Frankenstein is the scientist who creates this monster, and that more than half of the book, the monster tries to have a dialogue with Frankenstein about, you know, what have you done? Why did you create me? And what are we going to do now? And then for Frankenstein, the scientist, doesn't want to know. You know, this is this whole sort of idea of rejection. So for me, this is also a kind of metaphor about how this idea of a dialogue with machines is actually really important also on a different level, uh, more than just for making abstract films. Um, OK, so I talk a bit about my background, a bit about where my research is going. Um, and then a bit about how I approach this. Um, well, I already showed a bit what I did with this uh, pre-cinema, like talking about Marais, going back to what sort of essence of cinema, also a historical tracing, sort of the history of cinema back to its historical beginning. Um, so that's something I, I do. I mean, I find media archaeology really interesting, not so much because I'm interested in the past, but mostly because I'm interested in things which are different than what we have now. And the past is the closest I know of having something which is different than what we know. 
but it's still somehow there and you just have to look it up in archives and I'm always amazed how different things actually were 100 years ago. So for me this is mostly a way to get to a viewpoint which is different than what I have now. Um, so what I'm mostly doing on a sort of practical thing at this level at the moment is I'm working with analog computing so this is in a way sort of my lens or my tool through which I look at these questions about machines. So I have to explain a little bit what analog computing is. Um, I started being interested in it when I was sort of trying to solder a kind of video generator and then I remembered that when I was studying sonology in The Hague, this is the sonology electronic music studio, and then suddenly these machines appeared and they are, look a bit the same. I mean, they also have patch cables, just like the you know, electronic music studio where you connect all the generators and filters and all that kind of thing. Um, so I thought, okay, you know, I know how to handle this, patch cables, and, uh, and, and there's also knobs. And, but then I looked at these symbols and I could not make sense of anything this analog computer would do and what it, um, yeah, how you could actually use it. So for me, this whole idea of the analog computer stayed this sort of mysterious, uh, inscrutable device. So when I started soldering, I was interested in making electronics to produce video images. I sort of thought back about the analog computer and it sort of plunged me into a rabbit hole, uh, really back into the history of electronics. Uh, so this is the mighty analog tree, uh, which starts in all kinds of mechanical things. And then you have the trunk of the tree is something called the operational amplifier of amp. And then you get all the things like special computers, general computers, synthesizers, whatever. Uh, so you have this whole cluster of things, a lot of which are actually not so well known anymore because they have been eclipsed by digi digital computers. Um, and basically there's two kinds of analog computers, um, and I will explain a little bit how this works. Uh, this is an example of the most fundamental or simple kind, and basically what this is, this is a picture from the 1940s from a Dutch researcher working for Rijkswaterstaat, for the, the River Authority. And this is a model of the river, the Lek. And basically uh, what it is, is that you, you know, in, in electricity you have current. So you have basically a voltage and current. So voltage, you have high voltage, low vo voltage, and the current goes from high voltage to low voltage, let's say. And then how fast this goes is determined by the resistance. So this works for electricity. This also works for a river. You have high level, uh, water level, low water level, and then you have the river, which has a kind of resistance. So basically what you see here, these are resistors, uh, these are coils, these are capacitors. So all these, what these electronic parts do, uh, like they, they let current through or they can store current for a little bit. Everything what these um, uh, electronic parts do has this analog in water. So you can basically make a model of a river quite detailed. And the uh, advantage of this is that you can try things out. Like you have a sine wave generator on one side, which is a tide in the North Sea. And then you have a, a, a power source on the other side, which is uh, the, you know, where the water comes from in Germany. And then you can sort of model what happens. And then you change some resistors and you can see what happens if we would, for instance, make this part of the river much wider than it is now. Um, so that's, that's the most simple form of uh, analog computing. So basically what you do is that you take very often an electrical system which is easy to manipulate and you make a kind of electrical model of some other physical system. For instance a river but it can be all kinds of things. And this is a nice table of all kinds of uh, equations in uh, physical systems. And then you can see that for instance all these equations they look very similar. So it means that if you look at these equations, you can have an analogy between a mechanical system, an acoustic system, an electrical system, different aspects of electrical systems. So you can sort of formulate all these analogies, yeah? Uh, has it already been tried to, to reverse the other system if you try to make a better computer? Yeah. Okay. It's also that's really interesting about these um, uh, analog computers, is there's all kinds of weird forms of computing. Like there is, uh, what is it called? The Moniac, I think it's called. And it's uh, uh, an analog computer which is where you put water in and it's a model of the economy. I think it's in the Science Museum in London. So you put blue water in and red water, I think. I mean, I'm, I'm a bit s sketchy on the details. And it basically it's a model of how uh, money circulates in the economy, except that it's water. And it's made by an economist, I forget his name. Uh, and also in Russia, there's in the Science Museum there, this fantastic 
uh, there are hydro hydraulical computers which uh, do things like integration and can really do equations on them. And they're amazing machines. Um, so that's interesting also about this kind of analog computing is that you get this strange fauna of all these very weird systems which are analogs of something else, which is really beautiful. Um, so this is, for instance, uh, uh, this is one of these type of analogs. So it's basically a water tank and you put electrodes in them so you have a potential and then how the potential changes in that water is a model of for instance airflow and then you can put for instance a, a section of a wing and then you can sort of uh, measure the voltages around it in the water and then you get a very precise uh, image of how the, the air flows around this wing this is how they did these predictions in the 40s when they you know when there were no digital computers to do all these models um, so there's examples like that. Um, there's also, again, the Dutch. This is a model of the dike. So basically what you see here is a piece of resistive paper which is cut in the profile of, of, a, of a dike. And then they, uh, this is a kind of model of how water percolates through the ground. So basically what you do, so this is an explanation of how it works. You have the, the tides. And then basically what you do, you put the sign wave voltage somewhere and then you put rain well, for instance another uh, current source somewhere and then you just measure with the pen the voltage in different locations and then you have a an indication of you know how this water percolates it's super simple uh, and then this is uh, also from the dutch this was uh, a analog computing facility in the hague actually i've never seen it it was closed down in 83 ish uh, it was huge and it started in the 50s uh, and it worked for 40 years and it calculated all the dikes and it's completely invisible. There's no books about it, there's hardly any articles about it, there's pictures in the archive. And for instance, if you think about the first Dutch uh, digital computer, the ARA1, it's a computer which never really worked. It existed for two months. There's at least four PhDs and two books about it. And this is completely unknown. And, you know, it's not like the waterworks are not important in Holland. So it's, it's very interesting how this history is sort of, well, it's getting a bit well known now. Um, okay, so this is one type of analog computing. Did that make sense? So you basically build an electronic model of something else. And that's one. And then another one is a bit more uh, abstract, you could say. It's, uh, it's not a direct analogy, it's not like an electronic model, but it's basically you build a machine which can do equations. So, for instance, here you have these equations, and then you will see that, for instance, these integrals over there are actually units. So you have one unit which does integration, or you have one unit which adds two voltages together, or which multiplies two voltages. Um, so then what you can do is if you have all of these uh, boxes. This is from Philbrick, uh, and all these boxes they add things or they multiply things. You can have an equation which describes some kind of system, and you just connect these boxes so that the, the sort of flow of electrons sort of behaves according to these, e to these equations. And then you can also compute, so you can you have also an electronic model of that system. Does that make any sense? So it's not a direct physical analogy. It's it's your sort of putting the equation into boxes. I'm going to skip this because it's super interesting. But and then this is, for instance, a patch panel of a more recent analog computer. And then you see, for instance, these are amplifiers. And you can put more signals in. So you're adding signals. Uh, this up there is an integrator. If you put a signal in, it gets integrated. So you can also do differentiation. Uh, this, you can't read it here, but it's a multiplier. So you basically put x and y in, and what comes out is the multiplication of these two. And if you connect all these wires, you get a solution of that equation. Um, so this is the history. Like first, uh, this was sort of conceived in the Second World War. And first, like in the 50s, you had this large project funded by mostly American defense. So this is REAC. And this is a nuclear submarine in France. This, I think, was called Project Typhoon. And what you see here is a little model of a rocket. So this is doing all the calculations for supersonic missile. So this is, you know, early, yeah, early 50s. Uh, huge facilities, and this is probably the biggest ever built. So it was in England. Uh, so you have a whole building which is basically consists of power supplies, uh, servos, and then there's the control room where you have 
one of the best final ways in which you set up these equations is, you know, you flex just the whole building well, just to do mathematics. Yeah. Huh? Where was it? Uh, I have to look it up. I don't know. It's, uh, and then this is uh, also, I mean, this is a Laker, but this is NASA. And this, what this is, this is a facility they use to compute uh, orbits of rocket the, the going to the moon, trajectories going to the moon. So basically it's like a big synthesizer, you have these guy in suits and they sort of turn the dials. And when their trajectory actually hits the moon, they say, yes, we get it. And then they give the, they write down the numbers on their dials and then they give it to the digital people. And then they spend like three days verifying the calculations, but much more precise and say, okay, yes, it's true. If you do like this, you will actually end up on the moon. Um, so this is sort of what this is all about. Also, that you can have a, you have this model and you can sort of play around with it. That's how, why these things were built. Uh, so this is a thing about computing times. This is from the early 50s, from the Rand Corporation. So they say here, uh, the React is an analog computer. Individual runs on the React required only 40 seconds. Uh, and then it says, well, with some other things, it takes four minutes per run. And then they say, well, I think we're, oh yeah, here. They say, okay, this, this calculation took 64 hours of React time, and to do it with IBM punch card equipment would take uh, almost 2,000 hours. So there was, you know, it's a really very different uh, type of computing. This is fast, perhaps less precise. In IBM, you have to program things beforehand, and it takes ages. Uh, so this is, this, you have all these military projects. Uh, you also had in universities, researchers building their own, you know, uh, calculating departments. Uh, and then at some point this became an industry, so you have people, factories, companies selling these computers. Uh, so you have you know, different research institutes where these things were uh, built. Uh, also, this started in the US mostly, and then in France there was very early an industry of this. This is in Germany, this is from Telefunken, and then this is sort of the end of this industry. You get very expensive, complicated hybrid machines, which are digital and analog uh, in one machine. Uh, but then, so this is the really the top end, and then you get also smaller machines. This is like the first desktop computer. You can put it on your desk. It weighs 300 kilos, but you know, if your desk is solid enough, it will hold it. And then you get smaller ones, which are mostly used for teaching. So this is like, uh, you know, in sort of systems analysis class or whatever these subjects are called. And then, for instance, this one, it's a Comdyna computer. This was, the first one was built in 68, and they stopped production in 2004. So this for almost 40 years, this was you could just buy them, and also they were used in lots of uh, uh, yeah, electronics and, and control uh, laboratories for teaching. Uh, I'm going to skip this a bit because we have to hurry up. Um, nah. um, I wrote a little text which I want to read to you, but it's going to be a bit long, so I'm going to... Well, I'm just going to do it. Um, okay, because when I talk like this, what happens is this. I get carried away and I talk about all these, you know, histories and stuff, and we never get to sort of uh, more precise ideas. So to do that, I, I, I write also. So I wrote a little fragment which I want to read to you, and then I hope it makes sense. Um, Okay, machines and analogies. Uh, there are a few reasons why I decided to focus on computing machines for this research project. In my work, I'm interested to try and descend to technological structures that I consider to be fundamental in some way, resembling what Gilbert Simondon calls a technical object. Uh, I'm looking then for fundamental elements of technology, and these often become visible when tracing a gene genealogy, so that these projects of mine then involve lots of reading of contemporary sources, immersing myself in a specific technological culture and learning uh, skills that are necessary to work practically. From such an investigation of a fundamental element, I then like to try and build up a what-if scenario, a speculation of how a medium or a technology could have been otherwise. For, this is a, for me, this is a method to discover images and practices that are new to me, but it's more and more also becoming a way to formulate, and still very implicitly, a media critique. 
computing <laughs> machines seem an interesting choice because they play a role in so many uh, current narratives about technology. Bernard Stiegler speaks of a confluence which is going on of information science, nanotechnology and bi biotechnology and computing machines are central to these developments. Also for me it seems an organic choice given the fact that I'm interested in both the autonomy of mathematics and in ideas about material agency. Because in computing machines, mathematical principles and materials seem to somehow work together. Using analog computers instead of digital computers makes this a lot more concrete, but I have also noticed that the mystery of how mathematics inhabits these machines actually becomes larger when more concrete and not smaller. Even when I understand the equations I'm using, while I understand how that is translated into an electronic circuit, while I understand pretty much most of the electronics in these analog computers because they're quite basic uh, or fundamental and because I repaired most of them to make them work, still to me it's utterly mysterious that the voltages produced by two integrators and an inverter control a pen to draw a perfect circle. As you can see here. Uh, I'm certainly not getting used to that. Recently, I encountered the definition of machine and mechanism given by Georges Canguillem in his fantastic essay, Machine et Organisme, and it helped me a lot in thinking about the role of analogies in computing machines. His definition is as follows. We may define a machine as an artificial construct, a work of man whose essential function depends on mechanisms. A mechanism is a configuration of solids in motion so that that such that the motion does not abolish the configuration. The mechanism is thus an assemblage of deformable parts with periodic restoration of the relations between them. The assemblage consists in a system of connections with a determined degree of freedom. For example, a pendulum and a cam valve each have one degree of freedom, a threaded screw has two. The material realization of these degrees of freedom consists in guides, that is, in limitations on the movements of solids in contact. In any machine, movement is thus a function of the assemblage and the mechanism is a function of configuration. Are we still...? No? Okay. <laughs> um, I would like to propose two extensions of this definition to suit my purposes. First, I would like to extend this definition to machines that include mechanisms that do not depend on solids, so that it also works for electronics, chemical machines, or perhaps even quantum devices. A machine, so then it becomes uh, so I repeat also most of it, so you can hear it again. Uh, a machine is an artificial construct whose essential function depends on mechanisms. A mechanism is a configuration of matter so that its motion does not abolish the configuration. For motion to be possible, the parts must be to some extent deformable. For the configuration not to be abolished, it must be periodically restored. The assemblage consists in a system of connections with a determined degree of freedom. The material realization of these degrees of freedom consists in guides, that is, in limitations on the physical movement. And secondly, I would add, like to add the following to make it specific for computing machines. In computing machines, the degrees of freedom are chosen in such a way that the transformation of movement occurring in the mechanisms are analogous to mathematical operations. Are you are we still following? Yeah? It gets a bit abstract. There's a very obscure problem in Carroll's theory that is called Abraham's question. Abraham's question. And please remind me later to talk about it after we talked about the chaotic systems. And I was really struggling with this question, but I think this definition helped end that struggle. I can explain later if you're interested. But does this idea of analogy actually shine any light on what's going on in a computer? The problem with analogy is that it doesn't really explain anything. It's a label we put on a type of connection. In that respect, an analogical relation is similar, for instance, to the relation between the signifier and the signified, or even the relation between cause and effect. What is said is that two things occur together, by convention or based on observation, but not much more. In the case of systems that are described by mathematical equations, one could say that the real work was done by the scientists who formulated the physical laws de described by those equations. We can only formulate this kind of analogies after the empirical work has already been done and the mathematical similarity can be detected. But luckily, even when the nature of the an analogical connection itself seems to escape us, or to me at least, this does not mean that more can't be said about why analogies are interesting. I'm sure there must be a branch of mathematics that has analyzed different types and mechanisms of mapping, and one plan that I still have is to find out about it and study it. 
But in the meantime, it seems to me that a few things can be formulated, however tentative, about how analogies can be productive and how they break down, things that seem to be quite related. If we stay with the example of the analogy between water flow and electrical current, I think there are a few mapping scenarios that can be distinguished. The basic scenario is when an analogy, such as conceived, is working as expected. In our example, this would be the analogy, for instance, between water level, water flow, and basin capacity on the one hand, and voltage, electrical current, and capacitance on the other hand. No surprises. Interesting about such an analogy is that it goes both ways. So it's equally valid to regard our electronic circuit as a model of a river, as it would be to regard our river as a model of our electronic circuit. One physical system is the analog of another physical system, and the only thing we do is make the connection. Such connections allow for thinking across patterns occurring in multiple situations without introducing ideas of hierarchy or control between those situations. This in contrast, for instance, with ideas about programming, ideas that emphasize human control. The etymology of the word programming refers to a kind of public writing, and it had and it had an interesting change of meaning from first a musical program, so it's basically the announcement of a set of musical pieces that are performed during a concert, and later a journey towards its current use in computing via economics and military operations research. Programming puts the abstraction first and is about discipli disciplining matter and humans. Um, it bec things become more interesting than our basic scenario when we consider patterns of behaviors of our two systems that are adjacent to the analogies we formulated. The most common thing that happens here is that the analogy breaks down somewhere, because some feature of the behavior of one system does not map onto the other. Moving a magnet close to our circuit will produce some current in it, and perhaps we cannot think of an influence that would do the same with a river. I couldn't. Perhaps there is. Or perhaps there are fish in our river, and we cannot find anything into in our circuit that corresponds to those. Such breakdowns can be interesting in themselves, but generally it is more interesting if we find out that our analogies have a larger scope than we thought, and we found out that we can apply some of our knowledge of one system to the other. This seems to be an important aspect of how we are able to learn at all. A third area of mapping relations consists of those aspects of our two systems that do not take part in any of our analogies. This is something that can perhaps be compared to very cold or even dark matter in the universe. Most things we know about rivers and circuits will not be featured in any of our analogies. And perhaps we can say, perhaps it makes sense to say that most things about these systems we don't even know. A very inter interesting discussion involving those aspects of systems that do not take part in analogies took place during the 7th Macy Conference on Cybernetics in New York in March 1950. Uh, a series of conferences with the subtitle Circular Causal and Feedback Mechanisms in Biological and Social Systems. This discussion in 1950 involved most people who played a big role in the development of digital computers during and just after World War II, so such as John von Neumann, Norbert Wiener, Claude Shannon and Julian Bigelow, but also the inventors of neural networks Warren McAuliffe and Walter Pitts, and anthropologists and physiologists such as Gregory Bateson, John Licklider and Ralph Gerard, who triggered this particular discussion because he had doubts about the application of digital models to how our nervous system works. Much of the discussion at the conference revolved around the idea of analogous as opposed to digital, and except in some moments the distinction between analog as continuous and analog as analogy is not being made which is interesting in itself as an indicator of how important digital machines had already become by then. After some discussion, all participants agree that there is no hard distinction between analog and digital systems, and that it depends on perspective or function. For instance, John Strout from the US Naval Electronic Laboratory says the following, I know of no machine which is not both analogical and digital, and I know only two workable ways of dealing with them in my thoughts. I can treat them as analogical devices, and if this is a good approximation, I'm happy. I can treat them as digital, and if this approximation works, I'm also happy. The devils are generally working somewhere in between, and I cannot understand how they work accurately. An ordinary amplifier, if you put in signal at the right level, it's an analogical device. If you use too much signal, it begins to clip off with two states, a maximum plus value and a maximum minus value. 
and it goes from one stage to the other with the greatest rapidity. If you put in too little signal, you get noise from the st shot effects, part of which are quantical effects arising out of the motion of individual electrons in the circuits. If you look at the whole discussion, perhaps the most interesting two comments are made by Julian Bigelow, also somebody who was involved in building the electronics. It does not seem to me enough to describe a digital process as being one in which there are two or more discrete levels in which you are only interested saying whether you are at level A or level B. I think it is, it is essential to point out that this involves a forbidden ground in between and an agreement never to assign any value whatsoever to that forbidden ground, with a few caveats on the side. And much later in a discussion, after a remark by Girard about neurons perhaps operating in the forbidden zone, uh, continuous region, he says, the possible existence of operation in the forbidden zone, needless to say, is a contradiction in somebody's terms. If a device operates in an in-between zone, and if that's meaningful behavior, it seems to me one either has to throw out the term forbidden and admit that the zone is an acceptable one, having a value, or else assume that there are as many values as you please, and therefore as many zones as you please, and that therefore there is a continuum of zones, in which case the digital property really has vanished and you are talking about analogical concepts. This forbidden zone mentioned by Bigelow, inhabited by the devils mentioned by Strauss, sheds a different light on my dark universe full of aspects of systems that do not take part in analogies. Where I see this as an untapped reservoir of possibilities for analogies, we still have no idea about, it is also a place full of things that were excluded. Klaus Pias takes this discussion at the Macy Conference as a, par a point of departure for developing the idea of what he calls the cybernetic illusion. He makes the link between these thoughts about digitality and the underlying philosophy and metaphysics of some of the cyberneticians, who, according to him, try to establish a kind of community of machines and organisms at the cost of devaluing ideas of materiality. Their idea of information being independent of its embodiment seems to be a meme that has really taken off after cybernetics. And it's interesting to see what, uh, thinking about analog physical systems, what, for what kind of light that shines on it. Klaus Pias also shows it's possible to think about some of the social aspects of machines and technology through the lens of such quite abstract thoughts about analogies. I want to end this written fragment by holding out some hope of understanding better what analogies are in, th are in themselves. Recently, I've become very interested in the thoughts of Alfred North Whitehead, who was a mathematician before he became a philosopher. And so far, I found that encountering his universe of concepts, which is pragmatic and almost constructivist approach, is a very promising step towards rethinking this question and making it more concrete. There is something in the tone of his work that I really like. He is pragmatic, non-judgmental, acknowledging that our experience somehow works and that common concepts are at least symptoms of something that should be acknowledged. In the words of Isabel Stengers, I shall linger a bit over this relation to mathematical physics, because for me it designates one of the ways of expressing the importance of Whitehead's thought. The conceptual construction engaged in April 1925 may indeed be presented as the first philosophical proposition, allowing both the celebration of the exploit constituted by methemization, that is functionalization, that physics since Galileo had carried out on one hand, and the liberation of thought from the temptation to attribute a metaphysical significance to this, on the other hand. Are we still following? So this is a, a little too simple. Could we be more complex? <laughs> is it complex? Is it simple? OK. I'm sorry, yeah. Um, it's for me really, I mean, yeah. I really realize that if I talk about like give these kind of presentations, I only talk about certain things and these kind of things I can only talk about by reading a text. I'm really sorry, I'm also always, I, I tend to fall asleep when people read text, so I really hope <laughs> this works. It's because of Google, we don't fall asleep. Okay, that's good. Um, I think we have to do some crisis management. Uh, I have been talking for no, almost an hour and we're sort of halfway, not even. Um, so I just uh, continue until you know, somebody screams and we see what happens. Um, I will speed up. So I'm going to actually skip some chapters because this is sort of, for me, this is 
sort of the basis for which I'm working and sort of also already starting to make sense of things. And the next four chapters I have, which we're not going to talk about all of them, is basically for me different ways to, th yeah, it's basically collecting. So I'm sort of, you know, like collecting different ways to think about the autonomy of machines or computing machines. Um, so one important one, and I will only use one example, is mathematics. And if you read mathematicians, they talk about mathematical objects, and they very often talk about, if they talk about mathematical discovery, that it's like walking in the mountains. So it's walking in a landscape which already exists. Uh, and what's interesting, for instance, if you look at these equations, I don't know, like in art context, people get really scared when you show an equation. I don't know if it's true here, but one thing to point out is that these equations are not very complicated. I mean, they're really simple. You know, it's plus, minus, times, and the most complicated notion is this little uh, accent on the x. This is the, you know, this is not x, but it's the derivative of x, so it has to do with integration. But for the rest, we're just adding things and multiplying things, so it's not complicated. And what happens if you put these equations on an analog computer and you draw them, you get a very complex, uh, chaotic shape. And this also doesn't seem doesn't stop to surprise me. Like you have these very simple equations. Some of them give also a really simple shape, and others give this very beautiful complex thing. For me, so for me, this is really when you think about mathematical objects. This equation is a mathematical object, and then if you put it on the analog computer, you can turn it around. You can look at it from all sides, and it will create all this weird complexity, which is comes seemingly comes out of nowhere. So for me, that's sort of sign that something in mathematics is not under our control. Uh, this is from the analog computer. Uh, I'm not going to show this beautiful clip. Uh, another thing I'm not going to talk about is uh, how technology is, like if you talk about uh, uh, you know, development of technology, like nowadays is this idea that a lot of people think that technology has its own evolution, or that technology development of a technology is not so much de de dependent on us. Um, and sort of the link, uh, yeah. So basically, if you like, for instance, if this is you know these are stickers which are on, like I buy I buy these old analog devices. And then you find these stickers, and then you start researching NRL equipment. What does that mean, NRL? And then NRL is the Naval Research Laboratories, where you know a lot of the computers were actually invented. And it's from the Navy, so it's a military uh, institution. Then here you have the same Naval Underwater Systems Center. That's also from people, you know, developing underwater bombs. Uh, and then they have this piece of equipment, which 40 years later costs $50 on eBay, and I buy it, and they ship it to me, and you have this thing. Or you get a plug-in for your tectronics oscilloscope, and it comes from Los Alamos, where they, you know, invented the atom bomb and lots of other things. Uh, but then you sort of start wondering, like, what's what's going on? And then you realize that all these machines, they're not in themselves, they're part of networks, like our phone is connected to all these companies and all these other things. Uh, all these electronics, is uh, a lot of it is developed with military money to kill people. Um, so by even just soldering, you're part of this network and you're making a statement about it or you sort of participate in this. Um, so that's, so that's, that's for me a way like how these electronics are sort of connected to all these larger things. Like if you buy, uh, yeah, these, these old equipment, also if you buy new parts now in China, a lot of them are fake. So you get all this, there's also a way to participate if you want to buy p p parts there because they're cheap. Um, so one thing, like I'm really interested in this history of analog computing. So these are two books from the symposium, or very early symposiums on analog computing. So this is from 51, 52. And this is from the REAC uh, project, which is all funded by the military. So this is the lady with the nuclear submarine. She's in there. And what's interesting in symposium one is that there's a meeting between people from the Ministry of Defense, uh, people from all the big uh, aerospace companies, people from big electronics companies, where they basically sit together and they define what an analog computer should be like. 
how it looks. And basically in that meeting, how this machine is with, with patch panels and controls, that all these decisions are taken in that meeting. It's really fascinating to see that it's really, you know, that's where, how, that's where these things were defined. And that's the same with our laptops and our phones, is that most of the chips in there were originally uh, built by, for the military. And a lot of the, the things which are in there are were originally designed for uh, military purposes. So there's lots of, um, yeah, there's a huge influence there. I was not going to talk about the mega machine and now I'm just talking a little bit about things. I'm going to skip all this, it's super interesting, but that's part of also thinking about, you know, like technological determinism and also the idea, like uh, what are the forces which determine technology and how does that actually impact people like us who build devices or think of devices. Um, then there's this, uh, so I talked about mathematics as a sort of way to perhaps to be able to think about autonomy, which is non-human. The mega machine is sort of participating in the field of forces, part of which are non-human perhaps or part of which, which are human but alien to us. Um, and then there is this tradition which is very different from, um, uh, but also sort of thinking of, you know, how you interact with the physical, with, yeah, with, with mathematics. Um, I will, I'm trying to talk and sort of think about how to do this faster at the same time, so it doesn't really work, I'm sorry. Um, so this is a quote by uh, Ada Lovelace, so this is, she wrote in 1843 uh, some notes to the tr uh, translation of um, the notes on the analytical engine by Babbage. So it's, she was the f like also in the same uh, article, she publishes the first published uh, computer program, so 1843. Uh, and she also has some remarks about computing. So it sort of starts where the analytical engine is. So the analytical engine has no pretensions whatever to originate anything. It can do whatever we know to order it to perform. It can follow analysis, but it has no power of anticipating any analytical relations or truth. Its province is to assist us in making available what we are already acquainted with. So she says, basically, well, computing machines can only reproduce what we already know. Like they can put the equations which we have already formulated in motion. But then later she says that... Uh, uh, so to the bottom, here, here, this uh, is a decidedly indirect and somewhat speculative consequence of such an invention. Um, and then, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not doing this right. It's, it's however pretty evident on general principles that in devising for mathematical truths a new form in which to record and throw themselves out for actual use, views are likely to be induced, which should again react on the more theoretical phase of the subject. So it's basically, she's saying thing, something which is a bit similar to the mangle. Like if you have a machine which performs mathematics, you will have a different relation with this mathematics. Um, does that make any sense? Um, and then we get to uh, George Philbrick, who's one of the inventors of analog computing. This is a machine he invented in, I think, 36 or 38. And it's a model of a, of a, of a um, hydraulic uh, plant. And it has an oscilloscope thing in there. So basically you have this model of a factory and you can turn knobs and then you can see a curve directly on there which has an oscilloscope. So you can see sort of the signal or the, a graph of uh, some aspects of this, of this plant. And for him it was important that this relation is direct. You turn knobs and you see uh, how the model reacts. Um, and then later he, he's the inventor of these little black boxes. So this is an uh, early analog computing installation. He was the first to sell op amps, if you're into electronics. Uh, but he was also one of the first to sell analog computers. So you could buy a cluster of these uh, black boxes, like old multipliers or adders. And then you had a big screen. And then the idea was that you make a model of what you want to study. Like for instance, you want to study some kind of biological process of reproduction, whatever. And then you turn the parameters in your system, you put turn in these knobs, and then on the on this big screen you see the graphs of how you know this changes you are uh, modeling how they fluctuate with the uh, the difference in, in parameters. 
Um, so for him, it was really important that these calculations happened 25 times a second or 10 times a second so that you could really see, like in cinema, the change which was affected by the changing of a parameter. Does it make any sense what I'm saying? So it's a bit like, you know, synthesized. And then he had this beautiful term, lighting, lightning empiricism. I mean, he was a really interesting guy who had sort of hilarious uh, style of writing also. A uh, guy who knew, knew his classics. So he has this, this is from a journal he published sort of yeah, irregularly between 51 and 69. So it's called The Lightning Empiricist and then advocati advocating electronic models at least until livelier instrumentali instrumentalities emerge. And then there's a type like intentionally unconventional analoguery. Anyway, he was in the, in the process of selling, the business of selling these kind of uh, machines. Uh, and then this, I mean, I'm not going to go in here, this is McKay who was also doing, thinking of ways that you could interact with mathematical equations in stereo in real time. Uh, this is all early 50s. Uh, and then it's very similar to the world I sort of come from. Like if you look at the invention of audio synthesizers, it's a direct translation of the circuitry almost also and also the structure like the modular structure of analog computers i mean you can there's lots of um, interactions like some of the early synthesizer designers for instance worked for philbrick like there's a lot of very direct historical links uh, and this is uh, the same but then for video this is daniel sandin in front of his uh, image processor and this image processor still exists and basically also a modular synthesizer but not for sound but for video and video is also electronic so it's basically an analog computer which is what daniel sanders calls it. it's an analog computer optimized to produce video signals and this is daniel sandy now uh, and then this is his own copy of his machine super interesting machine um, and then you get this is from another inventor of video synthesizers uh, sort of the, the hippie idea of, of uh, feedback which is called synthesizer zen you become the feedback circuit most variable control knobs on the synthesizer have no reference scales on the pen instructions for operating them are given here in approximate numbers of turns experience shows however that with your hands on the controls and your eyes on the image as it changes on the monitor screen you become part of the system acting as the controller in a feedback loop the same way you drive your car. Happy driving. Um, okay, so I talked about mathematics, the mega machine, a bit more about the idea of interactive exploration or lightning empiricism. And then there's also different ways to think about how matter actually acts. I mean, we talked about it already a bit, like Pickering material agency. Um, Uh, there is, I'm going to skip this, which is a pity, there's him again, like I talked about his dance of agency, and then this idea that, like what Pickering writes about scientists in a lab, exact scientists, that they set up a, situ a situation where matter performs, and then they sort of go back to their office and they reflect, this is what he calls the dance of agency. Uh, there's lots of examples of this dance being much more chaotic or much more unruly, like this, this thing, like uh, this word serendipity, like this idea that you discover things by accident while looking for something else. Uh, the one ex famous example is uh, the invention of dynamite. Like Noble had, you know, his big cupboard full of chemicals, and then he left some chemicals at the back, and then it sort of turned into dynamite uh, by itself, and then he had discovered dynamite. There's lots of stories like that in sort of. Uh, late 19th century where you have all these cupboards full of chemicals and they do things and then scientists come in oh I just discovered this in my cupboard and then they you know they dis they're the d inventor of dynamite there's lots of stories like that also uh, you know I'm interested in electronics so if you look at the one major event was the invention of the transistor if you l really look in detail at how this transistor was invented there's at least 10 moments in that history which are accident you know, people crossing wires, literally, and then it works, and then they do it correct and it doesn't work, and it's like, hey, it just worked, how, how, what happened? And then they find out, oh, we have to cross it, that's strange. 
Um, so there's lots of things like that, which I find super interesting. And in a way, for me, I'm, I'm really going to skip this, which is uh, a drag, Gordon Pass, which is pretty interesting. Um, and for me, like the sort of utopic idea I have of this research project, and the reason I realized I'm interested in these analogies, is that somehow I would like to have devices where you can basically connect wires to matter, and the matter sends us messages. Does that make any sense? This is stupid. Uh, I saw, like, for instance, this. There's a strange guy called Jonathan Mills who invents all kinds of analog computers. He's one of the people inventing, uh, working on analog computers, and he has this beautiful uh, bucket of jelly with wires, and it's actually computing things. I mean, I know how it works. I'm not going to tell you because it's not actually not so interesting. Uh, but just this image of having a bucket of jelly and you put wires in it and it tells us something I thought was super interesting. So I want to, I don't know if it makes any sense what I'm saying now, but we can talk about it later. Um, there's lots of examples, but there's one also quote, it's quite short, by Stanislav Lem from a short story, which sort of um, yeah, explains this idea much better than I can. Uh, so it's from the story, How Did Microx and Gigant Launch the Nebulae? And it's one of the robot fables of Stanislav Lem, famous Polish science fiction writer. And it's from 64. So I'm quoting, I can assemble anything that enters my head, says Microx. But on the other hand, not everything enters it. This limits me, as it does you, for we are unable to think of every everything there is to think of. And it may very well be that some other thing, and not the thing we think up and which we make, is much more worthy of execution. What say you to this? Ah, you are right, of course, Gigant replied. But what can we do about it? And Microt answered, whatever we create, we create for matter. And in matter are contained all possibilities. If we contemplate a house, we build a house. If we contemplate a crystal palace, then a palace we fashion. If we think of a thinking star, we design a, bra a brain of flame. And this too we can construct. However, there are much more possibilities in matter than in our heads. And the thing to do then is to provide matter with a mouth, that it may tell us itself what else can be created from it, which would never cross our minds. Does that make any sense? Yes. Yes. Um, perhaps we can open for discussion the last I have three things to talk about, but these are like projects I'm doing. So they are artistic projects, which are fascinating. <laughs> but <laughs> also, if we, you know, if we want to have also a discussion, we should it's perhaps. It's good to have some time for the discussion as well. Sorry? It's good to have some time for the discussion. Yeah, exactly. Because you have, lo have lots of very interesting ideas in our heads, right? And you're also lots of interesting discussions. Yeah, so I'm happy to. Do you ask us to remind you about Abraham's <coughs> question? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, then the best way to address that is to, uh, well, I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm working on um, a few films which, yeah, are basically based, well, one of the things I do, I'm uh, sort of exploring chaotic systems now on the analog computer. Um, and one of the things which you realize, well, um, so what happens is like this is, well, uh, this is uh, the analog, analog computer which I have, so I use this. Uh, I have a studio. Well, these are all the analog, like some of the chaotic systems I've been exploring lately. Uh, so this is a patch on this analog computer, and then you get these kind of drawings on the plotter. I'm sort of going to um, the image of my studio. This is a studio. So this is an analog computer, and actually, I'm build. I, I built an analog computer which is much faster, like these analog computers, the old ones, they have very low frequencies. They can, you know, they work very well at 100 hertz or 1000 hertz, perhaps. If you push them, you can make high sound. But they're really precise, but they work very slow. And I made another analog computer which is optimized for video. So it's really an analog computer in the traditional sense with integrators and all these things. But it works until 50 megahertz. So you can make high definition video signals with it. So that's why I'm interested in you know, exploring these chaotic systems because I want to make images of them. Um, and then if you explore these chaotic systems, you get, uh, like I'm very proud of this one, I invented the chaotic system. 
you know, not by accident. I actually thought, okay, for a chaotic system, we need this and this and this. And then it turned out to be chaotic. I mean, it took a while to get there, but it's like three integrators and uh, one inverter and some potentiometers and one sort of nonlinear thing. Um, and basically what you have, if you have these uh, chaotic systems, I'm looking for one where there's also an equation. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm making a mess of my presentation. Like, for instance, this is a very strange chaotic system, and then up there there's an equation. And Abraham's question is, like, like Ralph Abrahams was the first to put uh, these kind of equations on an analog computer in the end of the 70s, when sort of this whole idea of chaos was sort of, he was one of those pioneers of thinking about chaos and complexity. Um, and his question was, like, how do we know that the behavior of this uh, circuitry is actually the same as uh, what is this equation. And it's a tricky one because you, like, if we have a simple system, like if you just add voltages, you can measure. But the thing with chaos is that these systems are very strange. Like they, you know, you, l uh, you let them running and if you have a very small aberration in something or you add a very small value to one of the values in your equation then it will completely diverge and become have a very different behavior that's basically the idea of this chaos uh, so it's a very interesting question like how do we actually know that if we make a system like this it will uh, be the same as this chaotic equations we have so that's a problem and it's a sort of an answer problem i also found people think yeah still thinking about it. I mean it's, it's a bit obscure but um, and I realized that after these definitions which I read to you and which are perhaps a bit too complex or too abstract to uh, read like this I realized um, that this that it's actually not so much a question anymore because uh, the answer is we don't we don't know it's the same Well, and it's a bit different chaos, but it's it's not we we don't like at the moment we we only thing we can do is wait, and then if after three hours it's still the same, we think okay this is pretty good, but then we still don't know that in next week it not it will not have diverged and probably at some point it will or we can actually be sure that at some point it will not be the same. Yeah. And what gets interesting is like, why was this a problem in the first place? Uh, and then for me, I think the problem is that you somehow think that somehow this mathematics is inherent in the circuits or something. Like there's some kind of metaphysical idea and then it becomes a problem because then you think, oh, but how does this work? But in fact, they're not. I, th I think the problem is that our intuition says if you can describe something simply with a mathematical equation, then the outcome should also be simple. So chaos tells us exactly It's, um, yeah, I don't know, good question. I think it's it's uh, it's a similar question, but it's not the same question because I think it's with electricity and water, these laws are more, uh, and I, I would say that these are s more simple somehow or that there is more, how to say, um, Perhaps it's simply that we have much more confirmation of how these, you know, water behaves, and electricity but behaves. Be sorry, but like, yeah, I, mean, I, I don't know, but, 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 but like any thinking where you sort of apply an idea from one domain to another domain, there's no way to know that it's applicable. Like you just, you find out by applying it. Or in fact, by applying mm -hmm. it, you get a new idea. Yeah. Um, and that by definition, you can't know if it's applicable because it, because the whole connection, the idea only came by applying one thing to the other thing. Yeah, except I think in the, if you talk about electricity and water, is that the analogy is uh, mm -hmm. 
yeah, you find out that it works. But it's also supported by the fact that the mathematics describing systems of water has been very well tested. Like we know about this already for a few centuries and electricity we also know about it already for about two centuries or so. Um, so the fact that this mathematical energy works is supported by also the sort of independent use of these 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 equations in their own domains. So this 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 is so making that analogy is sort of resting on the foundation of <coughs> like say two or four centuries of science where you sort of know that these are the laws which have been discovered like for sort of our you know our human scale. Uh, I, I mean isn't that there's a similar translation there? Isn't there in between the, I would assume, that between the physical material of electricity or the physical material of water and the equations about those things, there's a similar yeah, yeah, yeah. problem yeah. in there. And just you've got no way of knowing that no. they're being translated in the same way in both domains. No, but what I say is that in the, those equations are, have a much longer history. So we know better that these. Uh, equations are hold mm. so that if we make this analogy then we you know we can be more certain does that make any sense for anybody else i'm also seeing an analogy following from this but if we bring a magnet to a magnet transmitter and you have something unexpected happening and then you mentioned in water if you have some organism that you didn't predict it in your model so somehow this nonlinear in your equation that creates the chaotic equation or whatever can whatever that little difference that is found in the translation i'm just thinking that perhaps in the analogies from the real world those are like the biological bodies or the magnetic force no i'm just no, I, I think we should separate two forms of unpredictability. The, the chaotic unpredictability that means you have a very si a simple system, and then the tiniest rounding error can make it go in a completely different uh, way. And then you have the real open systems like the rivers or the mm -hmm. electronic circuits, where indeed the magnet or the fish are external factors which you did not include in the original system. Yeah. If you would use a mathematics only the mathematical model, in this case, these are linear uh, equations. That's why, basically, you can trust that your model of the of, of, of the hydrodynamic system and electrical systems will be roughly accurate. Mm. But the external factors, if somebody throws a stone into your river or somebody passes with a magnet, these are the things which, by definition, are not in your model. They're external, and that's what makes things dangerous. Mm. So there can be in the intrinsic deviations because it's chaotic, and then there are the extrinsic deviations which you will only notice in a linear system because the linear systems otherwise are very predictable. Yeah. But in the chaotic systems, you don't know was it an external disturbance or was it an internal inaccuracy that I didn't know, yeah. I didn't, couldn't measure. Now, what happens, like very practically with these things, is that you know if you plot the, like making a plot like this takes. Uh, 15 minutes, like you, you know, this is slow, eh? it's a pen sort of being driven by this machine. Um, they're never the same, if, if uh, because you know, this is <coughs> like super precise yeah. electronics, like the, the parts are amazing in that machine, like they're super high quality, everything. But even with that level of precision, it's never really the same. Because you, it you start from the same uh, boundary conditions, but yeah. you get a different result, yeah, yeah. that's what you would expect in the, yeah. in the, in the chaotic system like that. Because at some point, you know, there's a bit of noise or something, yeah, which... And that's the main reason why people have stopped using uh, analog computers. Because you yeah. can't control if you're a digital one, you map all the noise back to the ones on the zeros. And yeah, but you lose all that thing. <laughs> yeah. But that's what makes it analog computers also more interesting. Because yeah. Isn't there like an analog between that and You know, like so. So we, uh, uh, how to say, like, there's all these mappings, right? Like we, we we see the world in lots of different ways, and on some level, I don't know, like maybe I like to especially say is like, it's in ordinary life when we're not thinking about it, we confuse these things all the time. 
So if someone's telling me a story about what happened to them, or someone's describing a situation to me, I confuse their description with the thing itself. Mm -hmm. Or if I see a film, I confuse the film with the thing itself, reality. Or if, if I think about the film, I confuse my thinking about the film with the film. And again, I confuse that with someone telling me about the film. Mm -hmm. And there's all these different variations of, of reality and part of the way that we're able to kind of construct a reality at all and live life in any kind of coherent matter, ma manner is that we're able to confuse these things. Mm -hmm. We're able to get confused on this point about what, what, what is the thing. Um, and isn't that like a similar, it, in a way that seems to me like also similar to kind of Abraham's problem. It's as if he said, like, well, you know, how do you know that it's the same reality? How do I know that the, the f it's the same film when some, when I see the film or when someone tells me about the film or if I don't watch the film but actually go to the mm -hmm. Arizona desert and eat, like, it's the same. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly what it is. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, it becomes a problem when you confuse it, I think. That's what happens. Like, if you think that somehow these equations are inherent in the analog computer, then then you have a problem because then you don't understand and then, then you, you think, about how are we, we well know? Well, it's also a problem when you don't confuse it. Because mm. if, you're, if, you, if you were unable to confuse it, you would be unable to think about it. Mm -hmm. You'd be unable to, I don't know, you'd be unable to, it's like thinking is confusing things. <laughs> <laughs> Confusing different representations, different models, different analogies as being the same, people tend to do, but they don't do it because most of the time the analogies we use work. So the question is not so much why are the analogies different, but why do they sometimes work? And they sometimes work because through trial and error we have noticed that this water always turns in the same way, and this electricity always turns in the yeah. same way, and it's exactly the same kind of way. But, but I see a direct relationship with what, what uh, we're talking about. about um, metaphor and conceptual metaphor theory, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So in order, like in conceptual metaphor theory, it's not just saying that, you know, metaphors are kind of like a decoration on top of thought or on top of language, which makes language more colorful. No, it's say, not saying that. It's saying that you can't think without metaphor, mm. exactly. without yeah. the ability mm. to apply information from one domain to another domain to make these new connections within your own circuitry. You can't think at all. Yeah. So it's, it's what I'm saying is that the, 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 this ability to, we're now calling it confused because in, we're relating it to this kind of uh, problem on the wall. But without this ability to think in the, the one in terms of the other, which is in a sense the same, it's confused the mm -hmm. one with the other, you can't think at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, a, yeah. it's the nature of causality. The, the essence of cognition, at least cognition, means that you reproduce something in your head that was originally in the outside world, and you kind of assume that it will give you the same result. But constantly the brain is trying to make predictions on the basis of things you learn, but by using some kind of analog model inside the brain of what's there. And as long as it works, that's what cognition is. Yes. And often it doesn't work, but the, the, the wonder is why does it work? That was actually your question. Why do the analogy mm. work? That's, I think that's a very interesting question. Mm. I think maybe just one remark of Abraham's question that it was exactly about chaotic elements in a system, the non predictability of an outcome. What you're talking about is analogy, which to me has to do with that there is a, repeatedly, a re repeatability of those kind of mechanisms you see, or analogies you see. And we, we would be able to do multiple experiments or have, or have multiple experiences showing the same outcomes or similar outcomes, while a chaotic element just produces something which is not reproducible in the, in, in, in the same manner. So it escapes this kind of analogic, uh, analogical thinking. So you can never test if, if you, you have a chaotic kind of system, you can never actually test if what the machine produces would be the same because it's not repeatable. Touch upon on that. So, um, you get an analogy between things is uh, with the synchronic, the same moment of time between this time and that time. There's a similarity to it. You can also um, draw metaphors and analogy between things that are throughout time. So, you know, I have this here and this there. Mm -hmm. It's a time difference of space difference. And that which remains constant is this thing. If you look at the um, equations of, of the 
I mean, an out track. And basically, you can say that for T squared in time, what's an amazing variant is the way it translates these variables to the next step. And I think that's something very important if you want to make a comparison with the brain, because the brain not only extracts like features or structures as they look like, but they also extract the patterns or the rules by which these change. So if there is a chaotic or nonlinear kind of weirdness to the world, then we can still have a worthwhile pursuit of the rules by which it changes. And that in turn is a metaphor throughout science. So to have a predictability of the world is to have a, a kind of an analogous path throughout time. And this it's only by these kinds of analogies, these kinds of metaphors of generative rules um, by which we can do what we do and of a sufficient selection of the future transformation. So basically all these models are these kind of analog models in time. They are all exactly. models of processes. Mm -hmm. And that is what we are really interested in. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's being able to predict like if I put that much water in the river, what will happen downstream uh, five days later? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. No, interesting to think about it again. Yeah. Yeah. It's also the element of resolution, right? When you're thinking about uh, chaos and predictability. Yeah. I find uh, simulating a flag waving in the wind. Mm -hmm. And if you try to simulate like the, the movements of the individual fibers, which is chaotic, it's impossible to predict. Nobody can predict, like, okay, the next few seconds, all this whole textile will precisely be positioned like this. Which doesn't mean that it's not deterministic. No. We are uh, flag waving the wind is perfectly deterministic. So once the actions have happened, you can build a model that actually simulates a, a flag waving in the wind very realistically. So if you look at it from a very uh, big, uh, how to put it, just looking at the flag, you can kind of predict the flag. It won't. It will just suddenly try to go vertical no. or something. It, it <laughs> no. really kind of. Mm -hmm. But once you go deeper, suddenly you can predict it. Yeah. Even though you're still looking at the same object, it's resolution is really key here. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Models or analogies work by simplifying things. By saying it's analogous yeah. in these aspects, and I forget about the electrons in the water and the water molecules in the uh, the electrons in the electricity and the molecules in the water. I abstract all that. But then the question is yes, what's the right level or scale where you have to look at some of what you need? Mm -hmm. But then we're the same, right? Because like on one resolution we're all saying the same thing. Like if you were somehow, I don't know, like someone just totally came into this room for a different conversation, you'd be like everybody in this room basically just repeating the same point over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> but like at a all different time. resolution, so we're all saying like really like different things, you know. Basically if you zoomed out and like even further, you'd be like, every, every human beings on the planet are saying the same thing. Actually, yes. Uh, I mean, all this is about cognition. The ability to represent something in the world, inside your mind or inside the computer, that's the problem. How can you do that? How can you have one thing here and another thing there, while the other thing somehow mimics what the first thing does? Uh, without that, there wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to talk, we wouldn't be able to think, we wouldn't be able to live. It is possible, but it's not trivial. And, and the mistake people make is to think that once they have found an analogy, that's the truth, that it's all of it, it's possible. Mm -hmm. It's capture certain things, and it will not capture other things, and sooner or later, the model will deviate from reality, and uh, if you take a model too seriously, then you'll get in trouble. So. Something else I wanted to observe is that I very much like the fact that you're kind of, in a sense, digging up this whole history of analog computer and early cybernetics because indeed the digital revolution has kind of obscured that. There were so many interesting experiments going mm. on. I think it's very nice that you're kind of recreating these experiments because we have never known what was possible with these things because yeah. people too quickly switched to digital computing and to the digital paradigm, which has number of practical reasons that what you need lost us all these capabilities. No, but there's also still, I mean, there's some, I, I mean, it's part of the stuff I didn't talk about, but there's, there are people, I mean, it's small, but there's, for instance, there's a guy in Germany, uh, Bernd Ullmann, and he, he started, like, he manufactures, again, analog computers, and he actually sells them, and people use them, because they're faster for certain things. 
Okay, I think he sells them this one. I think he sold them to a university in, in Germany where they do something with protein folding and the sum equations, which are much faster to compute on an analog computer than on a digital. So they have, so he has a kind of interface that the computer uploads, like a digital computer uploads the problem to the analog computer and then sort of captures the result and does that, you know, I don't know, a few thousand thousands of seconds. And then it's actually faster, so it's a bit like kind of co-processor or something. I, I actually suspected all the, all the hype about quantum computing that it can be much faster. That actually you could do most of what quantum computers are supposed to do also with analog computers. Yeah, and there's this <laughs> thing quite incredible. There's a neural network computer. It's, I think this is in Heidelberg, and these are. This everything is analog. I mean, this is, is like uh, interfaces. You can pro program it. You know, you can. I think it works in Python, so you can upload something. But then all the neural networks are actually analog. So there, this I think there's big uh, silicon wafers in there, <coughs> like big like these, and they have like billions and billions. And it, you know, there's some parts. I mean, sometimes I read about uh, people who are interested in doing analog computing now, and mostly because yeah, for some really specific purpose. Uh, I think the one, uh, well, there's a few things like things like integration, for instance, in an analog computer is super simple. It's basically just a capaci capacitor. Uh, so it means that there's zero cost and you can have as many integrators as you want and it's all parallel. So I think, I mean, I'm not entirely sure, but I think that's probably what makes some equations fast. Like if you have equations which really depend on precise integration, uh, then yeah, then it's very easy to do with analog computers. Uh, and I think in digital computers it's harder because you have, uh, have all the time steps, you have to iterate something or, you know, I, I'm not exactly sure how it works in digital computers. But also the parallelism, with yeah. digital computers it's very difficult to work parallel because all the processes need to remain synchronized. Or with analog computers, they are by definition synchronized, yeah. it's just one flow. Yeah. So you can do thousands of things at the same time yeah. with analog computers. You just connect them, yeah, no, that's great. Yeah. Could it be natural relative to the resolution of the lizard is going to be the speed. And, and it's all about um, when there's this kind of, uh, when the trade-off kind of tips, if you're going to have really precise approximation of, of continuous functions with digital things, then there's going to be some point where analog stuff kind of gets uh, better, which is going to be differentiation. Yeah. Especially with neural networks now, they really use ordinary differential equations. It's one approach to it, which tends to be quite because which brings me to the other thing I want to say. So it's something really interesting now in the neuroscience where they use um, certain analysis techniques for neural population data. So these populations are also kind of chaotic. It looks very chaotic. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing they did very recently, it's pretty cool, is, is they take that data, it's all nonlinear stuff, and they extract the traffic from it. So that's what was interesting in you saying you're creating chaotic systems, but then you can also maybe create compositions of chaotic systems. Yeah. Uh, and that might be interesting to link with, with um, the neuroscientist kind of view of um, how you can create systems that seem like total chaos, yet you can extract um, certain canonical attractive ones. Yeah. So for every dimensionality, there's a certain set of typical attractive ones, like the rural M squared. But anyways, you've got um, the canonical attractive for every dimension. Yeah. Now I found a bunch of papers, like also there's people in Leuven working on uh, 
yeah, I found a very unlikely link, but you, which you are now touching on as well, between like neural networks and and people designing chaotic attractors, which are very complex, and that somehow these these fields they sort of uh, yeah, I found a few papers where these fields touch each other in a way. I think ah, oh, that's really for me was completely unexpected, but I think it's a bit the same with your point, Jana. Um, yeah, it was really interesting. Do you think do you, do you think a human being is an analog computer? <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, that's part of this, th these things is super interesting is that like whatever machine is sort of new, then this is becomes the perfect model of a human apparently. So like uh, I guess we were all pneumatic systems at some point and then we were all were telephone switchboards and then now we're all digital computers and you know, people believe this also uh, to a very quite a yeah, specific degree. And of course we are also analog computers, yeah, I mean, uh, but yeah, also not, I don't know. I think it's interesting, yeah, to see what uh, what looking in from that perspective allows you to understand instead of looking from a digital perspective. From and uh, and also I have to say, like, there's all there's lots of discussions about digital versus analog, especially like if you're a filmmaker, they can be actually really tedious. I mean, it's a bit over now, but like for a long time there was a discussion between analog film and digital video, or whatever. It's extremely tedious, and uh, so I was a bit hesitant to talk about this discussions and I think there were two like this one discussion the Macy conference was really interesting and there's also one somewhere in the end of the 19th century where you have Lord Kelvin talking to I think the grandson of Babbage and they also have a discussion about analog versus digital and it's also really super interesting and they basically say everything which comes back in these later discussions between you know like analog filmmakers and like exactly the same ideas that analog is more alive or that, uh, you know, all these, yeah, cliches, but also the cliches for a reason. Um, so, yeah, so it's interesting that a lot of these arguments are actually also really old. And, uh, it doesn't, and it doesn't change. <laughs> we still sort of say the same things. It's uh, interesting. Well, I mean, yeah, this part, if this is that we got to point nine on my paper and the last three were the art projects. So that's <laughs> <laughs> um, it's also interesting, like I find, um, yeah, you know, I, 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 I make art, you know, I make films and they, they function in, uh, f in, in certain parts of the art world. Uh, but on the other hand, like if I go to a bookshop, I, I sort of, yeah, I walk do a sort of, uh, I'd say, um, ritual walk through the art section on the way to the science section because I find it's way more interesting and that's where I spend all my time and my money. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think for a long time, you know, like, I, like music is interesting because music is abstract. Uh, so as a composer, I mean, at least where I sort of come from, like also the way, the kind of education I had in electronic music, as a composer, you, you're, at that time, it, I think it's also changed, uh, you were only talking about music, and we're not very much talking about, like if, for instance, if you look at theater or uh, visual arts, the kind of conversations you have are about art are much more conceptual, whereas in music, it's about the music, it's about the formal structure of the music, and I've uh, made, look, I have a history of making abstract films, which are a bit like music pieces, but then visual, uh, which uh, in some way you can also avoid all conceptual discussions because I'm just making abstract compositions of light. That's what it is. But on the other hand, and that's also and that's also a hesitation which you probably feel in my presentation, is that I'm really interested in how these things actually communicate something or how they things actually mean something. These abstract principles, like wha where they, do they come from? So that's why I talk about how technological principles have already a meaning because they are associated with their use, basically, in society. Uh, do you know the work of Mark Johnson, The Meaning of the Body? Uh, he's a philosopher uh, who has developed a theory of conceptual metaphor together with uh, the linguist uh, George Lakoff. Oh, yeah, his, yeah. His theory and his very nice, interesting view on music. And he speaks about both art, science, philosophy, all of those are what he calls metaphors of bodily interaction. So for him, the body has a whole repertoire of 
in it the way we need. And these dynamics are to some degree recreating this like music, and that's mm. why we like music. Because yeah. You recognize some of these inbuilt dynamics that are in our brain because we move in the in, in the music. And I think that's he 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 develops it with a few examples, but it's not very concrete here, but it's very compelling. I, I think he he really has a, a good approach, it's very close to what you have been saying. Yeah. yeah. Voices I really need the conversation with Seth or at the bar. But uh, yeah. There's Sorry, the people outside the door. Right? Yeah. Sorry. Well, maybe there is a class afterwards. Mm -hmm. They would, they would come in. Yeah. 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 But no, it would be great to, come, to continue the conversation. Let's just find out some ways. Okay. Thanks. Okay, well, thank you.